So as Betty said, my name is Teresa Duchateau, and I um, am employed with the Wisconsin Public Health Association. I'm working on a five-year grant to, um, the first part of our grant was to develop an assessment tool to be used by school districts across the state to evaluate the health services that they provide to students. And then the second part of our grant is to develop resources and tools for school districts to use based on the results of the assessment. Um, so we're in year two and a half, and we have about two and a half more years to go. Prior to working for Wisconsin Public Health Association, I worked for Aurora Healthcare in Milwaukee. I started out as a nurse practitioner working in their school-based health programs, and we had a partnership with Milwaukee Public Schools. We had, um, over the years, between 10 and 16 clinics in inner city schools. I worked my way up and became a supervisor and then a manager and prior to leaving, I was the director of school-based health and the pediatric program for the Visiting Nurses Association. So I have experience working as a school nurse, um, but in a different type of role where we had a school-based health center, which is um, a little bit different than school nursing. But given the fact that we were working in Milwaukee Public Schools and they did not have the capacity to have school nurses in all of their hundreds of school buildings, our program functioned as school nurses and school-based health centers. So our nurse practitioners, we had nurse practitioners, registered nurses, and medical assistants. Um, so the nurse practitioners some days were school nurses and were doing the immunization compliance checks. Um, but then we had the ability to then hold immunization clinics in our um, school clinics. Most of our clinics towards the end of our program were in high schools. In the beginning, we were kind of spread out in lots of different types of schools, but we saw the value of having nurse practitioners in high schools, and so we worked with MPS to find that good fit. So I have about 10 years of experience working in schools. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about school nursing. I um, received my doctorate of nursing practice from UW-Milwaukee and um, my focus when I was writing my final papers and doing my projects was on school nursing and nursing leadership. So I had to do a lot of research on the history of school nursing and what um, interventions school nurses currently are doing in the school setting. So um, I have a lot of experience in researching this area. So in the beginning, school nurses actually started in schools at the turn of the century, and they were public health nurses or community health nurses that were um, finding that a lot of children were missing schools because of communicable disease. So those nurses were then sent out to the children's homes to figure out why they were having these communicable diseases. But instead of just focusing on the student, they focused on the family as a whole and also evaluated what other concerns that family was having if there was a, a, a student that was child age or a school age child that had a communicable disease, there were probably other family members that had that same disease. So that school nurse worked with the entire family in that unit. In the 1970s, with the change in the disabilities laws, students who had complex health needs were now being um, enrolled in school, whereas before they were possibly in institutions um, so there were a lot more kids coming to school that had complex health needs. Because of that, school districts started to hire school nurses. And so up until that point, there were a lot of schools that um, had relationships with public health departments, and a lot of the school nursing was being provided by public health nurses. And then in the 1970s, it switched to, excuse me, to school districts hiring their own nurse. Um, there are still in the state of Wisconsin school districts that have public health nurses um, that contract or um, consult with the public school districts, but I would say the majority of districts have their own district hired nurse. Um, there are, over the years, with the lack of funding for public health, a lot of public health departments have been getting out of that role of providing health services. So in the beginning with school nursing, the focus was really on population health. It was really on those values of public health, looking at the entire school and the entire school district as the client. With the enrollment of children with special health care needs, the focus shifted to focus on individual students. And having the nurse show some value about why they're needed in a, dis a school district by having children be academically successful. But School nurses are still accountable for all of those public health 
things as well. There's a lot of laws in Wisconsin that says what school districts need to do related to immunizations and communicable disease. So there was an increase in the amount of work that school districts were asking nurses to do, but there wasn't also an increase in the amount of staffing that districts were um, hiring school nurses. So I'm not going to get too much into the laws in Wisconsin because there's another presentation today that talks about laws, but I wanted to just talk about what, law, what Wisconsin constitutes as a school nurse. Um, this law did change a couple of years ago. Prior to the change, a school nurse had to be a nurse with a bachelor's degree. Now the law states that it could be a nurse who has an associate's degree, but then they're required to take a course in public health or community health and that course needs to be approved by the Department of Public Instruction. If they were already a school nurse and they had an associate's degree and they were grandfathered in, there's no change in the education that they need to get. If there are a school nurse that um, has been hired after a certain date and they have an associate's degree, then they need to go on and get that additional class in um, public or community health. And the date is December 9th of 2011. So if they were hired prior to that, there's no change that's needed. If they were hired after that, they have to show that they've taken that course. So the recommendation from the National Association of School Nurses is that the, a school nurse should be someone who has a bachelor's degree. Um, and they, NASN supports a baccalaureate degree level for the nurse and also certification of the school nurse. And there's two ways in Wisconsin, I believe, still to get certified as a school nurse. One is through the Department of Public Instruction, and then the other is through the national certification. And there's more information on DPI's website and also the Wisconsin Association of School Nursing website on certification, if anyone was interested in looking into that. We put this information in this slide because there's a lot of confusion in school districts about who can be a school nurse. There are currently districts in the state that have licensed practical nurses and that's what they're utilizing as their school nurse and also there are districts that think an emergency medical technician can be a school nurse. Um, obviously the districts that you're working for are not un under that assumption because you're here as new school nurses um, but just to make everyone aware an LPN cannot function as a school nurse. They can be an adjunct person in the district to provide health services. They can re, um, have delegated nursing services that are delegated to them from a registered nurse, but they cannot be the sole person in a district as the, as the district nurse. And also an EMT. Um, they just don't have the level of education and training um, that is required to be a school nurse. And I forgot, I brought up a piece of paper to remind myself. Um, how many of you, this is your first year um, being a school nurse? Okay, how many of you have practiced as a school nurse for a year? How many for two years? Any, any more than two years? Okay, so the majority of you are brand new. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about local and national policy. As I said, I'm not going to get into the laws that, um, that govern what nurses do in Wisconsin. Here is a list of all of them that have some... Um, some information in them about health services that are provided in a school district. Not all of these laws is there a requirement for what a registered nurse has to do. The ones that are highlighted in red do um, touch more on the role of a nurse in a school district. At the end of this presentation, I believe I have a slide. Um, I, through this project that I'm working on, I've created a number of resources that I will um, share with you at the end. One of them is a nurse a school nurse blog. It's not really a blog, it's more of just a website with all of the resources that I found from the state and the national level all in one place. Um, and there is a page on there that lists all of these state laws and administrative rules with links to each of them on the website. So when we were developing the assessment tool, we incorporated the state laws and asked districts if they were um, in uh, implementing the state law, what the state law was saying was standard in their school district. And one of the feedback that we received is that school nurses really want a, a go-to place that they can find every law that pertains to school health services. So on this blog, there is a page with links to every single one of these um, state laws that I will make sure that I tell you about before the end. And these are the laws 
at the federal level that impact health services in schools. And the, majority, the ones that are highlighted in red, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. So those are the, the children that require IEPs and 504s, and the children that require some type of modification in the school setting um, due to their disability. Those impact what a school district needs to do, and it also impacts the role of a school nurse. So if you look at the pictures on this page, I think that a lot of times that's what people think of when they think of a school nurse. It's the person sitting in the nurse's office who's dealing with that individual child who may have had an injury, who may require a medication administration, who isn't feeling well, and so the nurse is trying to decide if the child needs to go home. Um, but here are, are the other things that school nurses do that are really behind the scenes that are really invisible to a lot of people in the public, but also to people within the own school district. When we developed the assessment tool, we, um, it was online. We sent an invitation via email to all school nurses and also every school district superintendent. And we asked that they form a team and complete this assessment tool. Um, the majority of districts probably had one person who took the lead and that person went around and asked questions to other um, people within the district if they didn't know the answer to the question. We had some where the school nurse completed the assessment on their own and the superintendent completed the assessment and then the two of them met. And what I heard from a lot of school nurses was the superintendent said, I had no idea that you did that. So this is all the things that are behind the scenes that nobody knows that school nurses do. So they're helping with school policy related to physical activity. They are meeting with a child who has a special health care concern and they're doing some case management with that child's family about how to provide services for that kid. They're doing education in the classroom. They're doing education for the entire school body. Um, the, on the left middle, it's CPR training. So some school nurses, if they're certified and being able to teach CPR, they're the ones that are doing it or they're helping to find someone to come in and teach CPR to the staff. They're doing screenings. So the middle picture, all the kids got to bring their stuffed animals to get weighed and measured. But they're doing height and, and weight measurements on children. They're doing education. Um, the far right middle picture, she's doing a hearing screen on an individual student. On the bottom, they're talking about hand hygiene and she's got a bottle of sanitizer. The middle picture on the bottom, the teachers have straws in their mouth and they're plugging their nose so the nurse is doing some education on the effects of asthma and what it feels like to be a child who has asthma. And the bottom one, emergency preparedness and crisis management. Um, that's, I think, a role that school nurses are underutilized in school districts. They have, you know, when districts are coming up with their crisis plans, um, unfortunately, I don't know that they think a lot about what they would do with students who have special health care needs in the event of a crisis, in the event of an outdoor um, natural um, environmental emergency, or if there was an emergency within that school district or within an individual school where kids had to shelter in place in their classroom. Um, that's where a nurse and their critical thinking skills can be really vital to a school district. So I encourage you to think about and to really educate the people in your district about the role of a school nurse. I think because of children with special health care needs, the thought is that school nurses are doing that individual intervention. But really, the role of a school nurse also incorporates that population health. It's the entire school district that a school nurse is responsible for. It's not just keeping those individual kids safe. It's keeping everyone within that district safe. It's checking immunization compliance to help to prevent an outbreak. It's coming up with a emergency medical plan um, for students that have health concerns. So NASN and the American Nurses Association, they define school nursing as a specialized practice of professional nursing that advances the well-being, academic success, and lifelong achievement and health of students. And the registered professional school nurse is the leader in the school community to oversee school health policies and programs. So they kind of hit it on both, that the nurse is focusing on individual students and all students, but they're also really the expert when it comes to policies related to health. 
So I encourage school nurses to be on the wellness committee within their school district, to be on the crisis management team, to be on the team of um, student support. So if the school psychologist and the social worker and the counselor are meeting, um, and, you know, ask if you can be included in that meeting. Because I think school nurses bring a really important perspective um, to that type of group. Nathan goes on to say that school nurses facilitate normal development and positive student response to interventions. And an example of that would be to develop a plan of care, a 504 or IEP for students with disabilities. So through the development of that plan, they're helping ch children have a normal, um, a normal education, having access to an, an education. And then also they're evaluating the success of that plan and the children's ability to engage in school. They provide leadership in promoting health and safety, including a healthy environment. So in Milwaukee, the previous um, director of health services instituted a policy throughout the entire district that buses were not able to idle in front of schools when they were dropping off or picking up kids. And given that Milwaukee Public Schools has hundreds of school districts and they contract with a private busing company, it wasn't an easy task. But now when you go, you can see the signs outside the school and outside the um, district office that no idling is allowed. And because in Milwaukee there is a huge prevalence of asthma, so this was something that as a nurse they said we need to do a change and um, this can have a significant impact on kids in our school district. And then the school crisis team as I mentioned providing that um, critical thinking that other staff in the school district would not have due to the fact that they don't have that health care background. How can a nurse inform a crisis team? Provide quality health care and intervene with actual and potential health problems and assisting a student who has um, suicidal ideations. You know, that nurse is many times viewed as the safe person in a school district, the person that a student sees over and over again, the caring person. And so a lot of times it could be the school nurse that that student seeks out. Even if they hadn't seen them before for any other type of health concerns, just knowing their reputation as being a safe person, that might be who the um, student goes to and tells them that they need help. Using clinical judgment and providing case management services. So determining if a student who um, was newly diagnosed with diabetes and needs insulin administration at school, um, determining when is it a safe time to delegate that insulin administration or that glucose checking to an unlicensed person. Um, having that level of training and understanding and making sure that when it's delegated, it's done in a safe environment. And actively collaborate with others to build student and family capacity for adaption, self-management, self-advocacy, and learning. And a school nurse can definitely be the person that helps families find resources in the community. So if a family is struggling to access health insurance, or if a family is struggling to find mental health services, that school nurse may not have the answer, but they can have, they have the skills to help navigate that and help families find those resources. The American Academy of Pediatrics is also a very strong um, supporter of school nurses. And they, at a minimum, feel that these are the services that a school district should provide to students. Assessment of health complaints, medication administration, and the care for students with special health care needs, a system for managing emergencies and urgent situations, mandated health screening programs, verification of immunization and infectious disease reporting, and identification and management of students' chronic health care needs that affect educational achievement. So once again, it's that population level services, identifying, um, making sure that children are compliant with their health, with their immunizations. It's also developing those plans for students who have special health care needs. And it's also identifying the kids in the district that have special health care needs. Um, Maybe the parent didn't put it on their emergency contact card that they have an EpiPen at home. But through conversation with the child, the nurse discovers, oh, you have an EpiPen? We probably should have a plan for you at school. We probably should get a dose of that EpiPen at school. Um, so the nurse serves all of those purposes. Nathan also goes on to say that the school nurse ensures compliance with school entry health requirements, such as immunizations, 
provides care and case management, monitors security and safe administration of medications, assures the health and safety of the students and staff, manages disaster preparedness and emergency service plans, provides health education and staff wellness programs, assures students compliance with state and local regulations related to health and safety, and identifies school health needs and advocates for necessary resources. So I'm sure some of you who are not full-time school nurses are looking at that list and saying, how the heck am I supposed to accomplish all of that? Um, and what I would say is every school district is unique in what their needs are. Um, familiarize yourself with what's required by law. So there is immunization um, compliance checks and reporting that is required by law. In Wisconsin, there is no law that states what type of health screening a child is supposed to get in a school. So we don't have a requirement for vision screening. There are things that children need to receive prior to enrolling in kindergarten, but the nurse is not necessarily the person that is responsible for coordinating all of that. Um, obviously doing vision screenings and hearing screenings on children who may have a problem, um, who've been identified in the classroom as maybe not paying attention, um, not picking up on what's being taught, those children should be screened. But there is no state mandate that every child needs to get a vision screen in fifth grade. Um, there are recommendations by experts on when those screenings should occur. So my recommendation is to go back to your school district, identify the health needs of your school district, ensure that your district is doing the mandatory things that are written in state law. Um, and the assessment tool that we developed, although it is quite lengthy, it's 100 questions, it's online, we are going to be changing it um, over the next couple of years to separate out the things that are mandatory versus the things that we encourage school districts to do because they're best practice. Um, but that assessment tool can be a really good needs assessment, especially if you're brand new to school nursing. It can help you identify these are the things that per law we're supposed to have and we don't have those in our school district. That might be the, the best place for me to start. And also looking at student safety. What things need to be put into place to increase the safety within that school district? And then go down the list. Um, you know, Staff wellness might be way at the bottom of your list. Um, so just know that you don't have to accomplish everything, but start to focus on what is needed in your school district. Um, we're a long way away from this, but the American Academy of Pediatrics does support a full-time nurse in every school building. I think the current, um, can I do my next slide? I think I do have a slide about this, but the ratio that is recommended by the National Association of School Nurses and the American Academy of Pediatrics is one school nurse to every 750 average students, so students who don't have a chronic health condition, students that don't require one-on-one -on -one care. When you start adding in the students that have asthma, diabetes, require medication administration at school, that number goes down, and the ratio of nurse to number of students goes down. Our average in Wisconsin, I believe, is 1 to 1,600 in some. Um, and I think in the, over the last year, we've actually, our ratio has gone down, which is a good thing. We're getting more school nurses, but we have a ways to go. And many states across the country have a ways to go to having a school nurse in every building. So there's, there's some challenges related to being a school nurse. Um, but there are things that school nurses can do to, to um, help alleviate these challenges. So the first one is there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of confusion about what a school nurse does. As I mentioned before, so much of it is behind the scenes. People aren't seeing that nurse sitting at the computer going through the list of students with, with um, chronic health conditions and ensuring that they have an emergency action plan or an individualized health plan. Um, they don't see the school nurse calling home and saying, your child has asthma, but we don't have an inhaler at school. How can we help facilitate getting an inhaler at school? So um, also, the, the nurse is typically the only health care provider in the whole school district. School districts talk the language of education. They don't talk the language of health care. And so it's really challenging for nurses to try to educate health, health or educational leaders about why certain um, health things are required or are needed. So for instance, one of the resources we developed was best practice guidelines for the management of anaphylaxis allergies in the school setting. And there is uh, an abundance of expert um, 
journal articles stating that school districts should have their own dose of epinephrine, that their medical advisor should have a, a standing order for the administration of epi to any child who appears to be in anaphylaxis. We have a law that, that allows school districts to do that. Um, but there are some school districts who are just really hesitant about having stock epi, and what does that mean for our liability? So, you know, in the healthcare world, when we're talking to school nurses, when we're talking to physicians and allergists, that might be a really easy conversation. But in the school world, when they're thinking about education and the challenges they have just related to education, it's um, sometimes a challenge. Additionally, nurses typically, if they are evaluated, if they have a yearly um, performance appraisal, it's typically on the number of tasks that they completed. So how many kids did they do 504s? How many children did they develop IEPs? Um, not necessarily on the, um, on the quality of the services that they're providing. And they're across the country and in Wisconsin, there's been a de considerable decrease in funding for school nurse services. Here was the st statistic. Um, so in Wisconsin, or, or com countrywide, the ratio of school nurse to pupils is 1 to 4,411 to 1 to 396. And regardless of how many nurses there are in the district, many times the expectations of that nurse are the same. So if they're dealing with 10,000 students and they're the only nurse, versus if they're dealing with 500 students and they're the only nurse. Um, some of that is just because of state law. There are things that school districts are required to do. Um, and so regardless of how many nurses they have, they need to get it done. There's a lack of a common language to document the interventions. So when we're thinking about school nursing uh, at a professional level, and we want to be able to document and show the value of a school nurse, we don't all talk the same language in, in school nursing. Um, and so there's challenges in collecting that data to say why school nurses are needed. Um, there was a potential fix in Wisconsin. We were going to go to every school district using the same software so that the state could gather that information and be able to report out on that. So nurses were going to be using the same um, codes about why children were coming to the health room. They were going to be using the same codes related to medication administration. But as of right now, that's not a go, and it, and it may or may not um, occur. So we lack some common language in school nursing, and it leads to difficulty in evaluating the outcomes. But the good news about all of those challenges is that there, there are people at the national level and there are people in the state of Wisconsin who are working on that. So in um, Wisconsin, we're 36 on this ruler. You can find this at the National Association of School Nursing website. It lists all the states and what their current nurse to pupil ratio is. We're 36 and our average is 1 to 1,625. Um, and the range in Wisconsin goes from one nurse to 285 students all the way up to 18,000. So one nurse is caring for almost 19,000 students. Um, so how do you succeed as a school nurse? And this is kind of the motto that I um, would hope that every school district would understand, that you can't educate a student who isn't healthy, and you can't keep children healthy who aren't educated. So health in schools goes hand in hand. So school nurses have to be, not have to be, it's uh, a good trait to have if you're independent, considering many school districts you're the only nurse. Um, but knowing that there are school nurses in districts that surround you, um, as Betty mentioned before, the Wisconsin Association of School Nurses is a great association to tap into. They provide mentors for new school nurses who are members. They have districts across the state that meet um, throughout the entire school year. And people just network and connect with other people um, that might be having similar challenges as them. Got to be confident in your nursing skills. Um, you know, when we, if you worked in the hospital or acute care setting, you always had that other person to go to, to step out in the hall and say, mm, how do I do this again? Um, so got to be confident with, with what you're doing. Um, aware of your community factors. Students are going to need resources that a school district isn't going to be able to provide. And so being aware of what's available in the community is key so that you can hook families up with those resources. Um, culturally competent, you know, our school districts are very diverse, children coming from all different parts of the world. So having that um, cultural awareness and being a critical thinker. 
school nurses are going to be put in situations where they're going to have to think on their feet and think about um, how they should work through the challenge that they've been presented. And it's really important to continue to educate yourself. So working within Wasson to educate, they have a conference every year, um, but also tapping into the resources that we've identified through this project to do some continuing education. Um, and it just makes you more aware of what's happening in the state and what resources that are out there that can um, enhance your practice. This is the homepage of the Wisconsin Association of School Nurses. Um, you can go to Wasson and then the third tab in, Join Wasson. Will, so when you join Wasson, you automatically become a member of the National Association. Um, and you can do that all from the Wasson website. And then once you are a member, you can go on to the member login page and there's additional resources. Um, the link to the Wisconsin Association of School Nurses is on the bottom there. And here are the Wasson districts. So there are five, six districts. Um, and we have an annual conference. Our next one is April 3rd and 4th of next year. And I believe it's in Madison. What's that? It's 9th and 11th? OK. And um, the National Association of School Nursing Conference is at the end of June. And that will be in Texas. And that's also a really great conference to go to. Um, so each of those Wasson districts has their own district meetings. And so nurses within those districts get together and talk about what's going on in that area of the state. So as I mentioned, um, just to share a little bit about the role that I'm currently in and some of the resources that we've developed. Um, we did develop the School Health Services Assessment Tool. Um, I believe somewhere in my slides there, are, there is a link to that assessment tool. Um, there's a link to the hard copy that you can download it or you can take it online as well. But it provides districts with a self-assessment tool focused on school health services and it really helps districts evaluate what they're doing. So are they meeting all the mandatory standards in the state? Um, and it helps districts identify the greatest need. So if they have a limited amount of resources, and um, this tool will help them determine where to focus those resources. It really does help the school nurses articulate what it is they do. As I mentioned, when nurses were meeting one-on-one -on -one with their superintendents and the superintendent would say, I had no idea. It helps nurses put on paper, to put into words, what it is they're doing. It adds value to their job. Um, and it helps leaders and personnel in identifying school health best practices that they could implement in their school district. So as I mentioned, when we developed this tool, we didn't want to just focus on state and federal mandates. We wanted to let school districts know what's best practice. That was one of the feedback that we received from school nurses, that they just don't have the time to do the research to understand what are the new best practices related to school health and population health services. So our tool incorporates best practices. So if a district was meeting all of the mandates and they wanted to focus their resources on others, they could go through that assessment tool and look at their results and say, here's a best practice that we're not doing. We have the capacity to do this in our district. We have the capacity to have a standing order for EpiPens because we can get free EpiPens online from this resource. Um, so then districts could start to do that um, intervention in their school district. So this was the instructions that we provided to districts um, that we really encourage people to, to talk about it as a team, not to just give the assessment tool to the nurse and say, here you go, but to work as a team to identify what are the gaps in the school district. Um, we had the feedbacks, we asked, we asked districts to complete a 100 question survey, and then we asked them to do another survey afterwards to tell us what they thought of the assessment tool. Um, but we did have a number of districts tell us what they thought, and many of the nurses said, this is a really great orientation tool for school nurses. It really puts it in one place, what I should be doing in my school district. Um, this is the link um, that you can find the assessment tool online. Um, it's on the Wisconsin Public Health Association website um, because that's the, the, the lead on this project. So if you go to the project resource tool page at the bottom, there it is in, um, highlighted in blue and you can just click and it'll take you right to the assessment. 
that's the picture of the um, WPHA's website. So in addition to the assessment tool, what we found when we did the assessment, and we had 117 districts complete the assessment, one of the resounding asks from school nurses was give us a sample of a best practice policy and procedure. And so we developed three um, sample policies and procedures. One is related to emergency nursing services. So the state statute that says school districts have to um, have a plan for emergency nursing services related to illness, prevention, illness management, injury prevention, and medication administration. We developed a policy and procedure. One is for a nurse who is hired by the school district, and one is for a nurse that is in a consult role. So if they're employed through a health department, through a um, healthcare organization, through a CESA, there's a separate policy and procedure for them. Um, it's just a sample, it's best practice, and we ask districts to take it back, look at what you're currently doing um, that's incorporated into that sample policy and procedure. What are you not doing that you have the capacity to start doing in your district? Um, because, because it is best practice and because every school district is different and unique, a district may not be able to take that policy and procedure and implement it fully. They might have to delete some things from it. Um, some of the best practice, obviously we wouldn't want them to delete the mandatory items. And the sample policies and procedures indicate what are mandatory and what are best practice. We also developed, I think there's seven policies and procedures related to medication administration. Um, there is an overarching medication administration policy and procedure. There's medication disposal procedure, medication error procedure, um, epinephrine for the non non-student specific epi, so that would be like the standing order for any child who's having anaphylaxis to receive epi, glucagon administration, and a couple others that I can't think of. Oh, um, student self-administration of medication, so kids that want to carry their own inhalers or their own EpiPens. So we add those sample policies and procedures that districts can take and use, and concussion policy and procedure. As I mentioned, we developed the food allergy best practice guidelines and we will, I think, oh, this is the school nurse resource blog. There's the um, website at the bottom. And all of those tabs on the top are different pages that just have tons of resources. So national resources and state resources, and they take you a link. And it says if it's continuing education, it says if it's a resource, um, it says if it's a webinar, so that you can go on there and if you're looking for um, some education to provide to staff on head lice, there might be a resource on there. So you wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. You could just go to um, that site and find something that might be utilized in your district. So this is a snapshot of the, of the asthma page. <clears throat> there are a number of webinars. So if a nurse is looking to do some continuing education, um, there's the asthma resource portal. There's another webinar. So there's tons of information on this page. And then the last resource that we're developing for this school year is a school nurse procedure website. Um, we have developed it. Um, we used a professional website developing firm. We have tested it, and we will be going live in the next couple of weeks. This is the home page. There are 31 procedures on this website, and they provide step-by-step -step instructions of how to perform that nursing procedure in the school setting. So this is an example of clean intermittent catheterization for females. There is a video, so seven of the procedures have a professionally developed video. The two catheterizations, we um, used a mannequin, we didn't use an actual child. All the rest of the videos have real children in them. Um, so the video shows you step by step how the procedure should be accomplished or should be done. The download button will, if you're on your desktop, will download a Microsoft Word document of the procedure that then can be customized for that individual student. So if the child needs to be cast every certain amount of hours, you can add that to the order or to the procedure. You can indicate what size catheter. You can indicate what type of cleaning the family does of the catheter. And then you can put the child's name on it. And if that is going to be delegated to an unlicensed person, you can use that step-by-step -step procedure as your training tool and you can teach them step by step how to do it. You can have them sign it, you can sign it yourself, and use that as the documentation to show that they have been trained and that they are competent. 
And you can also print off another one for them to put in the child's folder so they have the step-by-step -step procedure on how it should be done. And also the video that can be used as a training tool. You would still need to, as a school nurse, document that they have the skills. So you would need to um, observe them doing the procedure. But all of these tools could be used to train, um, to do the education, the knowledge piece of that training. So there's tabs along the top that provide the references. There's a list of what supplies should um, be um, available for the procedure. And then also considerations. So given the fact that these procedures are going to be done in the school setting, there are things that nurses need to think about that they may not have to think about if they were in an acute care setting, um, just given the nature of being in a school. So we added those considerations. And when you download the Word document, all of that, the considerations, the supplies, the references, and any resources that we found are included into that document. And then here's a screenshot of the video. Um, that is one of the urinary nurse practitioners from Children's Hospital who came and did and was the school nurse for the video. And then here is my contact information. We will be developing two more resources that we will be um, disseminating at the beginning of the 2014 school year. The, they're both going to be continuing education online tools. One is geared for the school nurse. It's going to be um, how to deal with individual student medical emergencies. So, you know, if, if we've practiced in the acute care world, there's mandatory training that our healthcare provider requires, our employer requires us to take. Um, we would do code blues in the hospital. In the school setting, nurses don't have access to that type of training. So this online module is going to be the knowledge piece behind critically thinking through what steps a nurse would take if they were presented with a child having a specific medical emergency. It's going to be interactive um, and at the end we'll provide um, a score and there'll be a post test. It's, um, the thought is this would be a education that a nurse would do on a yearly basis. So before school started or shortly after school started, they'd sit down and they'd do this training um, and that way they would just have the same starting point every school year about thinking through if I were presented with a child that was having this, what would I do? What steps would I take? The second is going to be an online training for unlicensed assistive personnel. And it is going to be how to provide services for the student with special health care needs. So um, not necessarily interventions that need to be delegated by a nurse, but how do you safely transfer a child in a wheelchair from the wheelchair to the toilet if that child is in diapers? Um, how do you provide um, using universal precautions? How do you do a diaper change on an older child? Um, one, using universal precautions, and two, respecting the privacy of that child. If there's a child with physical disabilities who requires oral care at school or needs to be fed, how does that unlicensed person do that? It's a tool that we're hoping to provide a standard of care across the state of Wisconsin so that everyone's receiving the same training on how to provide those interventions to that special group of students. Um, this would be um, an online training. It's going to have a pre and a post test. There will be a certificate at the end that the unlicensed person could print off and then put in their personnel file. Um, once again, it doesn't necessarily, the nurse doesn't have to delegate those things, but the nurse would want to ensure that those people that are assigned to provide those services in the school have some form of training and so that they're doing those interventions safely. So those will be coming out in um, the next year. And so to get information about all of these resources, um, if you sign up on the listserv for DPI that Betty has on the DPI School Nurse website, all of the information that we develop as part of our project, Betty is one of our project partners, so all of that information is disseminated using that listserv. Um, and then I also get email addresses from Betty. And so when we have newsletters or things that are coming out as part of our project, we send out that information.